What is up, everybody, from our AT&T 5G virtual studios? Welcome on into group chat presented by AT&T 5G. I'm Susanna Collins, and uh, it's a wonderful Friday indeed because I am joined by my bestie, my my former co-host, um, a guy that I miss terribly, uh, Kalen Carr. How are you doing, sir? Great to see you. Good. I thought I only existed in group chats, actually, with you, where this is actually to do <laughs> it in, not in person, but I guess where I can IRL. actually see you. Yeah. I know. I know. Yeah, we don't we don't really venture into the like FaceTime chats with the no. the group chat because you know that was we don't early in the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're good now. <laughs> no, 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 thank you. But this is this <laughs> exactly. I guess fo it follows me wherever I go. But this is <laughs> this it's it's wonderful to see you. Wonderful to uh, be co-hosting with you once again. Back like we did back in the day. Wow. Those, were, those were good times, and That's we're gonna. Right. I know, I know, twim forever, baby. We um we have got so much to talk about. A really fun show today, and we're gonna kick things off uh, talking about the U.S. men's national team, baby. Because I see the shirt. Uh, You're rocking it, right? What's up? Absolutely, of course Reppin. I am. Of course I am. A, a massive result for them in World Cup qualifying, two 0 win over Jamaica. They are now sitting on top of the standings of their group ahead of Mexico on goal differential, which is uh, very exciting news considering where, how we were feeling maybe a month ago um, about all of this. They have, uh, they've kind of turned things around and you know why Ricardo Pepe, Ricardo Pepe. It is his <laughs> world. We are just living in it. I'm so jacked about this guy, Kalen. Um, he scored both goals for the U S last night. He has now played in three U S games um and scored or he's played in two u.s games and scored three goals which is ridiculous like yeah. i mean that that kind of scoring percentage is um you yeah. know that's that's all right i don't but know you know what the extra time guys will say about the underlying numbers in this one but i feel like if you have more goals <laughs> than games that's, that's a good that's thing. gotta be pretty good yeah it's all right it's all right yeah. but kaylin he is 18 years old old and i i am just going to beleaguer this point because i truly cannot believe it we um we had him on the call up a couple months ago and jill and i looked at each other and we were like this kid like he he doesn't seem 18 he doesn't <laughs> seem 18 just in the way he he kind of speaks and and talks about the game but then also you watch him play and he's got such composure and such poise at such a young age, in huge moments, this is World Cup qualifying. This isn't a friendly against Jamaica. This is this this game matters. I mean, and he has now scored three goals um, in World Cup qualifying at age 18. And I think that there's just a huge amount of excitement um, around him, which in kind of makes me a little bit nervous because I feel like that's a lot of pressure to put on somebody, especially when. The U.S. has been searching for that sort of central forward position, a guy that can put the ball in the back of the net uh, consistently. Um, it seems like Ricardo Pepe could be that guy, but um, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to temper my enthusiasm. But at the very least, I mean, it was such a positive result for the U.S. An incredible game and and moment for him, Kalen. What are what were your thoughts on on watching the match, watching Ricardo Pepe last night? Well, well, do you think he may have gotten some confidence from coming on the call up? Possible. I mean, I mean not saying, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying that all of this kind of, you know, happened shortly after his call up yeah. appearance. Also, his heroics at the All-Star game um was like very soon after that call up appearance. Mm, so like okay. he's been on a roll ever since. Right. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I was actually a little bit, I wouldn't <laughs> say nervous, but I was interested to see how he would respond yeah. um, to some of the attention. And then I think him going from the start, because I think when he came in in the last World Cup qualifier, there really wasn't a lot of expectations. I mean, it was a difficult environment and it was a difficult match where the U.S. really was not playing well at that point in time. And it was looking like we were heading towards maybe a disappointing result. And he came in and changed everything. Right. I think it was yeah. a goal and a couple of assists. 
um, did fantastic. Uh, but I thought going from the start at 18 is a little bit different pressure and with a lot of expectation too, because everybody since that last match was rightly so excited to say, oh, well, we have our number nine, just pencil him in and pen or, you know, what, you know what I'm saying? And it just didn't, uh, it didn't seem to, to unnerve him. And yeah. he, what, he had a little trouble getting on the ball in the first half. He didn't get a ton of touches. But I think we saw in some ways a little bit of what makes him so special is that he doesn't need a lot of the ball. He doesn't need a lot of touches or a lot of opportunities to make a difference or to make mm -hmm. it count. I believe he had two really clean looks on goal and two clean goals. Uh, and that seems to be kind of the MO for him um, getting in and around the box. He just kind of has that knack for being in the right place at the right time. And then you sort of feel when it falls to him that he's going to put it away. And I think it goes back to a little bit of that maturity and poise that he has. And um, I got to spend some time with him in Dallas a couple of years ago. And geez, that's crazy to think because he was probably like 16 at the time. Yeah, and, or I remember this movement maybe. episode. Yeah, and he, I watched him play in um, the USL and he scored two goals in a semifinal of the USL uh, playoffs. And I, and I was like, oh, wow. It was just kind of like, this guy just seems to score goals at every yeah. level he's been at, just has a knack for it, natural finisher. Um, but to see him doing it at the highest level for the U.S. and to do it in Texas with his family in the crowd was also a really cool uh, oh, moment for him. That was awesome. Yeah, they tweeted that out after the game. Um, his whole family was there, and they're just hugging, and he's taking selfies. And I was just like, what a moment. Yeah. What a moment for him. Um, just, I mean, yeah, I think <laughs> – like I said, a month ago, I was not feeling so great about um, the U.S. men's national team and and how we were performing. But it's 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 amazing what. Or um, even if you did feel good do. or hopeful about it, you you still questioned who's gonna who's gonna number nine position. Yeah. And I think we've had reasons to feel some hope this summer with the wins and the tournament and feeling good and and then saying you know Gold Cup, Nations League, all that, beating <laughs> Mexico. But you're still kind of like. Oh, you kind of need that finisher still, right? Like I you still know. need that guy up top. And um to see Pepe step up, um, wow. I feel like for FC Dallas too, um, they're having fun on social media, which is oh, boy. <laughs> always great. They're going nuts on Twitter. Pay whoever whoever <laughs> runs your social media account, FC Dallas, yeah. pay them even more because my goodness, that was just it, that was a great follow last night. You're maybe, always a great maybe follow. A, but I was dying. No, totally. Maybe a portion of that transfer fee coming from Europe, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, say it ain't so. No, it's definitely happening, guys. Oh, enjoy Peppy while you yeah. while you can. <laughs> we also have some very fun news coming out of MLS, Kaylin Carr, because the um, 2022 MLS All Star Game presented by Target is going to be held on August 10th at Minnesota United's home field, Allianz Field, which you and I have both been to. Um, it's awesome. It is so, it's so, it's just, it's almost, it's like perfect. I don't know. They didn't, they really didn't miss a thing when they built this, this stadium. It's absolutely stunning. Um, so this is going to be again on um, August 10th of next year. Um, just a culmination of week long events. It's going to be broadcast on ESPN, Univision, TSN, and TV off sports. Uh, we don't know yet who the um, opponent is going to be, but I'm just super excited to, I mean, number one, Minneapolis St. Paul is there. It's like, it's the twin cities are awesome. They're so great, especially in the summer, you know, like I'm, I'm from the Midwest. Like I, I am used to these, uh, these sort of brutal, brutal winters. It's, it's a whole other thing there in those winter months. I was there for the stadium opener actually. Um, and it was in April and it was blizzarding, like, blizzarding for that April. one just the... yes oh wow it yeah. was wild it was absolutely wild um so that was yeah that was something but i'm telling you minneapolis in august it's going to be incredible and also the food at this oh, stadium yeah. is next level i did a Wait, BTW didn't you shoot. do yeah you yes! did a whole like uh it was like a top chef chef's... episode yeah top chef yeah it was incredible. You can check that out on YouTube, by the way. BTW, you. legendary Look at that show. Plug. We did a Top Chef inspired episode with um, just, uh, Chef Justin Sutherland, who was a contestant on, I can't remember what season of Top Chef, uh, but he is, he's like the executive chef of the entire 
stadium. So he sort of oversees all of the the menus. And we did a nacho making competition. Um, mm. And it was incredible. It was so much fun. But the food there, you guys, oh my gosh, it's just awesome. It's I'm super, super pumped. Um, what you, you've spent some time with there. Oh, yeah. I was just going to say any stadium with a chef is a good start or an executive right? chef, no less. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a good start. Cause I remember going to stadiums growing up and it was like, what do you want? A hot dog? Hot or, dog. Or a hot dog. Yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. Okay, cool. uh, yeah, no, that sounds great. I mean, the stadium itself um, is, is really beautiful and the atmosphere there is off the charts. Um, the supporters groups, the uh, dark clouds, the red loons. I got to spend a lot of time with some of the supporters groups there. Um, that, that really, really cool. Uh, I think there was, Glitterati is another one. There's a bunch. Yeah. Um, for, sorry if I'm forgetting some of them, but uh, yeah, I went to some, the pubs across around around the area and across the street. Um, there's a really cool um, pub there, and they do a um, they do a uh, drag night actually, and That's it's awesome. really really fun. So if you want to go like have a beer before the game and then you go watch the all-stars play. And then afterwards you want to check out a drag show. Um, you can definitely do that. So uh, we, did, we did that in the movement episode there, which was really fun. And um, yeah, it was a blast. It is. It's a, it's a very, very, very special place. The, the soccer culture there is, is awesome. And, you know, we kind of preach like the whole soccer for all inclusivity aspects of this game and uh, Minnesota and their supporters in particular, really, really very much embody all of that. Um, so I'm, it's, it's, they are worthy recipients of, uh, of getting yeah. the MLS all-star game. Cause it's going the bar to is be called black sick. heart, by the way, black heart is the name of the pub. Just wanted Check to it sure. out. All right, kids. Let's uh, let's look at some some MLS standings, shall we? Because it's we getting it's getting a little spicy. Uh, we've seen some moving and some shaking. It's it's really wild. It's actually crazy that New England is the only team in the East that has uh, just locked in their position. No one's touching them, obviously. Um, but what's crazy is that positions three through eight are all within three points of each other okay wow. Phillies there at 42 Atlanta at 39 DC NYC FC and Montreal are all on 40 points so you think about that battle for the top four to get home field in the playoffs it's going to be wacky like I'm so so pumped and I want to talk about the team in um in seventh right now Montreal okay because they're coming over coming off of a huge 2-1 win over Atlanta um and they they have been consistently above the playoff line pretty much all season, which I don't think anybody saw coming. Um, certainly not me in my preseason predictions, which they let me know about. Um, but I mean, you just have to get give so much credit to Wilfred Nancy. Um, what he has been able to do with that roster where there's not like this like huge DP signing. There's not like these like overwhelming uh, big names, but these these players like Georgi Mihailovic and Ramel Kyoto, I mean, they're just they're getting so much out of these guys, and here they are, uh, completely in in playoff contention. Now, Atlanta is right below them, right? Okay, and they've kind of had this like late season surge a little bit, and so this is going to be so fascinating. This sort of battle to get above that playoff line in seventh place. But I just want to point something out here: Atlanta, the remaining games for Atlanta. Okay, Toronto. Mm -hmm. NYCFC, who just suffered a big loss with the loss of Anton Tinnerholm. Um, that's massive. Miami, Toronto again, the Red Bulls in Cincinnati. Okay. Wow. Like if you're Atlanta, you're like, ah, yeah. Yeah. We yeah. we can get we can make some points. Montreal, Philadelphia, Orlando, Toronto, Red Bulls, Houston, and Orlando to finish. So they've the, those Philly Orlando games, I mean, I and Red Bulls are playing well now. This is not if I'm looking at the two teams and their remaining Are you doing I'm it like, again? Are you I doing know. it again counting out Montreal? No, 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 no. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Okay. I'm just okay. saying. I'm just giving I'm just giving people the facts. This is, this is what this is this is what we're looking at. But um I would just if I were an Atlanta fan, I'd be feeling pretty optimistic but again like you said do not count montreal out because they have uh sort of defied the odds all season long um and it's gonna be really really fun last 
like sort of month of the season. Somebody Galen good, Carr. yeah. Somebody good is gonna miss out there. If, if you, I mean, you, can you imagine New York City not making the playoffs? Right. DC has had a fantastic season. Montreal, right there. Atlanta, New York hasn't missed the playoffs in I think a decade. So Columbus, the defending champion. So, whew, somebody's Woo-hoo! missing out. And that, that's gonna be tough, right down to the wire. Um, let's take a look over at the Western Conference here, and we see Seattle still holding on to the top place. Just a couple points ahead of Sporting Kansas City. Uh, They, of course, had that big win on the road against Sporting Kansas City of late. And Colorado hasn't found the best form as of late. Are they trending in the right direction? (laughs) They're still hanging on to that third spot right there, although Portland has been surging. They have been very good as of late. And similar to the East, the West might even be more crazy below that because once you get to the fifth spot with Salt Lake and you go all the way down the Galaxy, Minnesota, we were just talking about about briefly their beautiful stadium, Vancouver, uh, LAFC, San Jose. I mean, there is literally six points to break up fifth to 10th, I believe right now. It's wild. uh, That is really, you know, the one place to look a little bit is just that Minnesota and Vancouver have one game in hand, and we will yep. see um, only four games this weekend for Major League Soccer due to uh, the international break, but both of those teams will be playing this uh, this window. So Minnesota will be playing Colorado. That is a huge point for, uh, point on, on the line for both teams. And then Vancouver will go and play against Seattle top. So Ugh. Vancouver and form, but those two matches are, are huge, huge, because you, they straddle either side of that Western Conference playoff line right there. So Minnesota yep. and Vancouver have a big opportunity. You always say, oh, well, you've got a game in hand. Well, it doesn't mean much if you don't make the most of it. And Vancouver has a tough task, but I think there's something in there for them. I think they can actually uh, potentially get a point and maybe even sneak a, a win against Seattle, um, maybe with some absences for them. And then Minnesota is going to be playing against a Colorado team looking to rebound from a, dis- a disappointing loss to Seattle. Oh, it's exciting. It's really, really exciting. And as you mentioned, Kaylin, we only have four games this weekend because of the international break. So um, we're going to get into some some game focus. previews. We're yeah. going to dive into um, some of these matchups. So we're going to start with the Red Bulls taking on Inter Miami. Uh, that game on Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern, Univision, 2DNA, Twitter, and The Zone. Okay, so right now the Red Bulls and in Inter Miami sitting outside of the playoff picture. But, but... As you said, it's not impossible, right? Okay, there's seven games remaining for each of these clubs. So there are opportunities for them to collect points, to go on some sort of run. But this is this is a big one in particular. This is a big three points um, at stake here. So right now they're sitting in ninth and 11th, as we saw in the standings, 34 and 32 points respectively. Now, Miami, oh my God, <laughs> they're, they're a weird one, right? Like it was like, oh, everyone had kind of written them off. And then all of a sudden they go on that, like this little run. And it was like, oh, wait, have they figured it out? Like defensively, like they're, they're not yeah. allowing goals. Their DPs are playing well, like what is happening? And now <laughs> after that six game unbeaten run, they have now lost four games in a row. So <sighs> Okay. I know it was, I feel like I got bamboozled a little bit by Miami. I was like, yeah. Oh, here yeah. we go. Um, which is a, a little crazy. And then the Red Bulls. Okay. Like they, they, they were struggling. It was just, I don't know. There was just no consistency for them, but they are unbeaten in their last five games. Okay. Patrick Mala has been absolutely on fire for them. Um, he has been involved in five of their last seven goals. He scored twice. Um, has three assists since uh, the middle of June. So, he, you know, they've they've found their footing a little bit. And you said it, like, this is a team um, that has made the postseason every year for the last God knows how many. I mean, like, a postseason without the New York Red Bulls in it just feels very uh, foreign and very strange. Um, yeah. But that is, that's the reality that they're they're facing right now. Kaylin, when you look at, at, at this matchup, um, <laughs> What do you, I mean, do you believe that one of these teams could potentially make it to the playoffs? I think Red Bull would have maybe the better, they're in the better form right now, which, you know, sure. if you're just sort of looking at the, the recent trends, but I think it may be difficult for both just because the way we uh, spoke about earlier, you broke down the Eastern Conference really well and just how strong the Eastern Conference teams are, even that are hanging right in and around that bubble. Um, But, you know, I think 
for this weekend's match, um, one point really isn't going to suit either team uh, in their effort to kind of make up mm -hmm. rounds, which will make it an entertaining game to watch, right? Because you feel like both teams are going to really have to go for it. And if you look back just three weeks, these two teams played and Red Bull just completely ran Inter Miami off the pitch 4-0 uh, win. So that's been really the issue for Inter Miami is when things have gone south, they've gone really south. And mm -hmm. inconsistency has been um, their Achilles heel where, you know, that they lost 5-0 to New England earlier this summer. And then from then on, actually, they went on a really good run of form where it felt like a wake-up call. And Phil yeah. Neville was saying, hey, it took me a while to adjust. And now we have this team and belief and we're, we're kind of, you know, not giving up goals. And really, they were just defending pretty well. Uh, Gregory, I think, really helped them out who came into the team partway through this year. And then they were getting some production from their DPs. But these mistakes have just compounded where when it goes south, it goes one, two, three, four, and a couple of matches in a row. Um, and they really have no margin for error at this point. I think Inter Miami really needs this match. And I think going against a Red Bull team that really uh, kind of gave them the business a couple of weeks ago will be a yeah. motivating factor for Phil Neville and the guys to, to see if they can sort of salvage the season. Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a really interesting one, like you said. I mean, this is a, a very important three points for for both teams. Um, so I'm expecting I'm expecting some some fireworks in that one again. Uh, this game Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern, Univision, 2 DNA, Twitter, and DAZN. All right, let's move it along to Cincinnati taking on Philadelphia. This game 8 p.m. Eastern on Saturday on ESPN Plus and DAZN. So, um, you know, the big storyline here. You know, Cincinnati. Okay, they're they're in last place. They have they have finished dead last in every season that they have been in MLS. Okay, um, so this is a this is more of a a this is this is pride on the line, right? This is how do you want to finish the season, especially since they fired Yap Sam, right? Now they brought in the storyline here is that they brought in Chris Albright, who was Philly's technical director. Okay, mm -hmm. so so Chris Albright is going to be the new GM at uh, Cincinnati, his first order of business is literally to find a new head coach for this team because they have not got it right <laughs> since they started. I mean, this is going to be their fourth head coach in three years, which is, you know, like something, something's not working. That's something's not working. It's yeah. a lot. It's a <laughs> lot. So um, that is a lot of pressure on, on Chris Albright, but clearly Cincinnati has looked at this sort of Philadelphia model. What, Chris Albright has done as technical director and, and said, this is, we like this, this is the direction that we want to, to go in. So it's kind of interesting that these two teams are, are, are playing together. Obviously. I mean, Philly um, is in third place right now in the East on 42 points. Um, they're a playoff team. Like do are are we, do we feel comfortable about them in the playoffs? Like, you know, what is your, where do you stand on Philadelphia? This is, there's the supporter shield winners from last year. Um, and they've kind of, I don't, they've fallen off a little bit, but they're still, you know, they're in the mix. They're still a, a playoff team, but how comfortable do you feel about this team right now? I feel really good about Philly because uh, I think they've actually come into form a little bit and yes, mm -hmm. they lost in the champions league, but I thought they showed really good um, fight to play and go toe to toe with club America. Um, and I think in a way that kind of, reinvigorated their season. It's weird to say um, because it was in sort of a campaign that came to an end. But I, I felt like they proved something to themselves in that period of time and since then have really found um, even better form. But anytime you tell me you have a team where you have Andre Blake in goal, um, you have solid center backs, you got leadership with Alejandro Bedoya and you have some weapons up top with Shabilko and Santos, um, um, that's a pretty good recipe for success. Yeah, And I, I think this Philly team is kind of going into the playoffs with not a lot of expectations. They don't have the supporter shield. All of the sort of eyes are rightly going to New England. And I think even Nashville, mm -hmm. Orlando also is getting some, some press. But I think that's a really sort of sneaky good spot for Philadelphia and kind of suits their style of play and personality of the club. So I, I think that's a, a good spot for Philly. I, I think they can do some damage in the playoffs. Um, on the other side for Cincinnati, the biggest move I think of thinking Albright in is getting somebody with MLS experience. 
Mm-hmm. And we, we've seen in the past, Cincinnati has big ambitions um, and want to be a big club and really have the foundation for all of that. They have incredible facilities, a beautiful stadium, and fantastic fan base that's so passionate. Um, it's a great city. It's a soccer town. And it just hasn't quite lined up with the results on the field. And so when you bring in somebody with some MLS experience, and we'll see who he ends up hiring as uh, as the head coach. Um, but for these players, for the rest of the season, this is a tryout. Like yeah. I, I don't know who's on guaranteed deals or, or how locked down they are. But if you're playing on this for the rest of the season here and you have a new technical director coming in, you know some changes are about to go down, right? And so I, I think that for a team like that, it's going to be extra motivating to – to really try and put a good performance in. Um, I don't think the model so much will be Philadelphia for Mm -hmm. FC Cincinnati. I would look more towards a club like Orlando where they had big ambitions. They had some big players really work out for years and years. And then they kind of go out and get more MLS experience as a head coach, which I I would expect Cincinnati to find maybe a similar profile to an Oscar Pereja who who can really sort of mold a culture around the team and kind of get things going in the right direction. Um, So I think that might be an interesting sort of model of a franchise to look at um, if you're an FC uh, Cincinnati fan. Time now for a 22 under 22 (laughs) presented by Body Armor Stopwatch Players Spotlight. Yes, and we are going to, uh, we're actually going to talk about one of Philadelphia's young players, uh, Leon Flock, okay? This is a 20-year-old midfielder for the Philadelphia Union. He has a goal and two assists um, in 2,153 minutes this season for the Philadelphia Union. Now, he's an interesting player, right? He's a, a dual national, so he's represented both Germany and the U.S. at the youth level, um, and Philadelphia had been watching him for a while, and they snatched him up and he was super excited to come uh, to Philadelphia because he fits in very well in this uh, system in Jim Curtin's system, you know, this sort of like high pressing system. And that is him. He is, he's a, he's a really versatile midfielder who likes to get forward, but then he's also can get, get it done at the defensive end. Kalen, what do you, what do you like about Leon Flock and his yep. style of play? He's been a, a, I think kind of an unknown, or at least he was an unknown, unknown to me coming into this year. And we were wondering how uh, Philadelphia was going to manage or cope with some of the losses they have with Mark McKenzie and Brendan Aronson moving on and who is going to sort. Montero's been absent for parts of the season. Now he's back. And um, but Flock has been really, really steady. And I like he can do a lot of things very well. You mentioned Mm -hmm. his uh, his athleticism. He covers a ton of ground. That's uh, how Phil House plays. He's got he's good with both feet. He can finish um, when he gets the opportunities. He's honest, he defends, he presses, and he's good in possession. Um, so I, I think overall, he's a guy with a ton of promise. And I think when we look at U.S. men's national team, I think some people have already started to hint that he might have a future um, mm. if he continues to, to play well. I could see a guy like, I don't know, you know, I don't know if it's going to happen right away just because it's such a crowded space, but he clearly has the talent. Um and I looked him up, actually. I saw he has Houston roots, or he spent some time in Houston yeah. and then went over back to he was Germany. Born in, born back. in Texas. Yeah. So you got to love that. I think he's a Houston Texans fan as well. So hey, um, look at you. Yeah, pretty pretty good to, uh, to see that. But anyways, I, I think he's a, he's a really interesting player. And I think more than anything, he fits their system well. And I think yeah. that that's something where when you look at Albright, and we mentioned him before, Curtin and um, Stewart. Yeah, sorry, Ernie Stewart's not there anymore, but um, – um, Ernst Hanner and the whole front office, they've done a really good job of finding players that don't just have talent, but also suit their system. And I think Flock fits into that. It's moving along to some more <laughs> game previews. We've got a big uh, Cascadia Cup rivalry match between the Seattle Sounders and the Vancouver Whitecaps, 9 p.m. Eastern on Saturday on ESPN Plus and TSN in Canada. Okay, like Seattle's good. I don't know what else to like say about Seattle at this point. It's like, okay, you're, you're good. You're in the playoffs. Ma. Like, I mean, they're... <laughs> I, 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 it's, it's ridiculous. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm out of superlatives to, uh, to describe Seattle and, and what they continuously are able to produce on the field. Um, but Vancouver, Vancouver is an interesting one. 
Okay. Like this is a, this is a very interesting team. As we saw they're they're definitely within that playoff picture in the West, which is like a, a crazy landscape right now. Um, they are coming off a three nil win over San Jose where Brian white, who was acquired from the New York Red Bulls was a very good player for the Red Bulls. Um, back in June, he had a, his first career hat trick. Okay. For, uh, Right. Vancouver and this is <laughs> I read <laughs> Matt Doyle has said that Vancouver is one of his like favorite teams to watch right now like he he literally called referred to them as like a snooze fest for the last like 10 years aside from like the Alfonso <laughs> Davies moments and all of that but like he was like they are playing very um exciting wow attacking football right now and um you know we know that uh they said goodbye farewell to uh their head coach dos santos uh back in august and um you know since then vanny sartini the interim head coach has done a pretty a pretty remarkable job you know they're getting production from guys like brian white um they've got some really exciting guys like dybert caicedo and Kristen dahome um they're and they are they have been fun to watch and kind of completely off of people's radar you know they're a team that we just don't really talk about all that much but here they are completely in playoff contention what are what are your thoughts on uh this Vancouver side. Well, they're right in it. You know, they're right in it. And I, I mentioned before this match against Seattle. Uh, first of all, you have to also remember this is a Cascadia Cup match too. So anytime you see uh, Vancouver and Seattle go after it, you know that there's going to be um, some fireworks and a little bit extra on the line there too. But I, I really do think this Vancouver team um, can get a result against Seattle and not everybody mm -hmm. that's not a, an easy statement to make because Seattle has just been so consistent but I think with some of the pieces that Vancouver have uh, especially with their mobility because if you look at their ability to kind of get in behind and stretch the field in different ways with Caicedo going down the wings into home and these guys who really have a lot of pace and then I think the piece that's really changed it for them as well too is Brian White and yeah. you mentioned it just He's just a physical presence. It's very hard to uh, not send one or two bodies to him. And if you give him an inch in the box, he's feeling it right now. He's got that confidence. And we've seen in stretches in the past, in limited minutes with the Red Bulls, his goal return was, was quite high. Uh, he doesn't need a ton of minutes. He doesn't need a ton of opportunities to get goals. And when he gets one, he tends to get two. And I think for a Seattle team, they're tough in the back. You, you know, I think they've only given up 22 goals, which is the lowest in the Western Conference. Um, but I think this Vancouver team will find a way to get goals. I think it's going to be very difficult to keep them or for any team to keep them off the board right now. Um, and then it comes down to kind of the other way, which is, I think, probably the bigger question for Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Is it how if they can defend at the same rate that they're scoring goals at right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, if they are able to uh, get a result against against the Seattle team, is this I mean, did they suddenly become one of these like keep your eye on on Vancouver? This is a dark horse. Would we call them a dark horse? What do you think? I don't know. I think they're I don't know if they're a dark horse because I would say they're right in the mix and the thick of it for the playoffs. And I don't think that if they make the playoffs, I don't anticipate them to make a deep run, but maybe that's what makes them. A, maybe that's the yeah, definition. That's, that's, that's literally the horse. definition of a dark horse, Kalen. <laughs> yeah, but even just making the playoffs after the season they've yeah. had where they were, yeah. they began not in uh, Canada for l most of the season. They lose their manager. They have a new manager come in. So much change and you know turmoil throughout for them to make the playoffs, which they're right on the edge of. Uh, would be a huge success and a step forward. Let's go. Let's go, Vancouver. All right. Uh, our final match of the weekend taking place on Sunday. Minnesota hosting Colorado this game, 4 p.m. Eastern on ESPN Plus and DAZN. This is an, this is an interesting one. This is a, a, a going to be a good, good matchup. Okay. So Minnesota right now um, in seventh in the west on 38th points okay they are they're just they're hanging on for dear life uh to that final playoff spot and then as you mentioned earlier colorado um they are in that third spot in the west they have been comfortably well within the 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 playoff picture for a long time in fact they were competing for those the top two spots at one point they've kind of uh 
I don't know. Have they fallen off? You you sort of alluded to them them falling off a, a a little bit, but I'm looking at these two teams and I'm 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 more cons- I'm concerned about Minnesota. I'm just a little mm. puzzled by them as to why they are not higher in the standings than they are right now because they have they have the the names. They've got some some quality players, um, especially coming off the type of season that they had last year i mean making it to the the western conference finals um and it just i don't know it just feels like they're under performing this year kaylin am i am i correct am i am i wrong i think you're right i think you're right in this case suzanne who am i gonna gonna go against susanna collins are you kidding me uh no i i think i think you're onto something and i think the what it comes down to I think for both teams actually is a lack of goals. Mm -hmm. And we saw what Reynoso was able to do through the stretch run last year. And I think we sort of projected that that was going to carry forward and that that was going to be sort of um, an everyday occurrence so that he could potentially make a run up for MVP. Um, I think him and Zellerion were kind of the two sort of standout number 10s in the mm-hmm. playoffs and looking on either side of things to say, oh, wow, like these guys are, really have it. And in moments, he really has. And in moments, they haven't been able to get the best out of him. And when he hasn't been around, if Ludd's not in, he hasn't really had a partner. And yeah. they just haven't found enough goals. I think just 30 goals this this season um, for them. And then... I think Colorado as well, too. I mentioned they're kind of trending down and it, it's not so much that they have had, you know, loss after loss, although they, they did have a really difficult performance against Seattle where Seattle just kind of steamrolled, steamrolled them. Um, but it's been more kind of unconvincing performances where they haven't they've either given up goals to draw or mm-hmm. um, felt like there was more in the games for them. And I think think for them it also comes down to goals and lacking a reliable uh goal score i think barrios is their top goal scorer with 30 or no, excuse me with seven uh goals this season and they've kind of done it by committee and on set pieces and they've been strong defensively which has helped but but if you look at the western conference uh seattle has 44 goals sporting kansas city has 51 goals this season colorado has 38 and then below that is Portland with 45, Real Salt Lake with 45. Yeah. So if you just look at the goal production numbers, um, it just hasn't been quite enough, I think. And to say they're in third place without that shows to how good of a team and that they've been mm-hmm. able to get it from a bunch of different places. I just get concerned as we get late in the season and you need somebody that you can say, I can count on a goal from that person or, you know, Rui Diaz or yeah. uh, Daniel Shallowy, the way they're sort of stepping up um right now at this point in the season and I, I think that's a little bit of a worrying sign for Colorado Ooh, the other worrying right. part for them too is they're going to be without Acosta and Mark Anthony K this weekend for yeah. international duty which are a big part of the their piece of the puzzle so uh you look at Reynoso and how he's going to find space he might have a little bit more uh joy in this game Man, this is going to be a good one. Um, Guys, let's take a look at the full schedule for the weekend. As we said, there are only four matches for you to enjoy, so no excuses not to to check these out. Starting on Saturday, that New York-Miami game, 6 p.m. Eastern on Univision, 2DNA Twitter, and DAZN. We've got uh, Cincinnati-Philadelphia at 8 p.m., and then followed by Seattle-Vancouver, 9 p.m. Eastern. That's on ESPN Plus and TSN in Canada. And then on Sunday, the lone match on Sunday, Minnesota-Colorado. Colorado, 4 p.m. Eastern, ESPN Plus, The Zone. Uh, these are some really, really. Suze, which one are you matches. most excited for? Which one are you? Which one are you circling of the bunch? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I'm circling that Minnesota, Colorado one. I think is uh, is is going to be really interesting. Um, although the New York Miami game as well, um, just because I think these are these are there are only four games, but there's a lot at stake here. This, these are a lot of uh, important points that are up for grabs yeah. this weekend. So you got me hyped for Vancouver. You got me excited. I, for that listen, one. I we don't talk. We never talk about them, and so I I think it's 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 time that we give them some some credit. And when Matt Doyle is like giving them credit, then I'm like, okay. Yeah, but fine. he gave Not him a little backhanded like, credit. He gave him a, like a backhand. He was really like, good. Yeah, there was a little shade in there. Also, so. I just want to point out, I have a Montreal flag in my background. So is that a I, Montreal flag? <laughs> it is. So that or the, the scarf. Sorry. Yeah. But, um, but that's their. Uh, isn't that awesome? I love their little snowflake. Yeah. I think uh, it's pretty. 
pretty cool. So I am not anti Montreal. I just, you know, I, I, I got called out very early on in the season when I had them finishing very low. In USA my shirt pre-season. with the Montreal scarf behind you. Very international. I would expect this is North about. America, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go. Kaylin, um, always a pleasure. So good to oh, see you. Likewise. Sure we'll, be, likewise. sure we'll be texting later. Back to the, the group, group chat. chat. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, but guys, enjoy all the soccer this weekend. Thanks so much for, for tuning in and uh, see you next week.